Good morning. It's good to see many of you out here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're happy you're here. Be sure to see one of our deacons in the lobby after services so you can get a welcome packet. I have some information there about the congregation, what we believe, and so forth. And there's a little visitor's card in there. We just ask you to fill that out, drop it in one of the two baskets, or hand it to a member. So we just thank you for uh, you being here this morning. If you want to open your Bibles, I'm going to be in Exodus this morning is where we're going to begin in the book of Exodus. Uh, chapter 16 is where we'll be starting. From time to time, I've been asked the question, or perhaps you have asked the question, um, of whether or not Christians should practice the Sabbath, uh, a, a day of rest on the, on the seventh day of the week, so Saturday. And one author noted that of the many groups that profess some belief as to be Christian, at least a dozen, including Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Baptists, the Church of God, Seventh-day, and the Worldwide Church of God, teach that the Sabbath-day requirement of the Ten Commandments is still binding upon the people in the New Testament age. But as that quote would indicate, not all believe this. So we want to see this morning, what does the Bible say about the Sabbath? Is it still binding? Is it not still binding? And so this lesson isn't so much an application lesson, but a knowledge lesson. Help us come a better, have a better appreciation for what the Word of God teaches and better, better handle it and better give an answer when we are asked this question. And so, uh, the first point we need to understand about the Sabbath, it was given to Israel. Like I said, we're going to be in uh, Exodus chapter 16, starting in verse 22 is where we're going to be beginning, uh, starting this morning. The first mention of the Sabbath in the Scriptures it's found in this chapter, starting verse 22. It's given to the children of the Exodus. So the Israelites who have just coming out, have come out of Egypt. It says, Now on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers of each one, when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, uh, This is what the Lord meant. Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil, and all that is left over put aside to keep until morning. So they put it aside until morning as Moses had ordered, and it did not become foul, nor was there any worm in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Then it's important to note that this is the first instance in the scriptures of which the Sabbath is recorded. You will find no instance of the Sabbath, by that name, as a mandate for the people of God prior to this. We do not find any evidence in the scriptural record of Adam and Eve observing the Sabbath, nor did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the forefathers. What we do find is here in the 16th chapter in Exodus that it was given to Israel after the Exodus. This observance here, this commandment, would be codified in the law of Moses in just a few short days at Mount Sinai. You want to turn just a couple chapters over to chapter 20, verses 18, excuse me, 8 through 11. So in the Ten Commandments, after the first and second and so on, of you know, so it says in verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall, do, you, excuse me, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in it and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Now real quick, verse 11, those who will advocate the observance of the Old Testament practice of the Sabbath, will point here and see, see, God bless the seventh day, we need to keep it. Okay? But note the context. Exodus 16 is the first time it's given as a commandment. Exodus 20 is the first time it is given as an ordinance of a law or a covenant to the people of God. What Moses and God is referring back to and referencing back to the seventh day of creation is that, see, we have, this is, the re, this is present. If God rested after all his labors, this is the reason why this law is being given. Not that it's referring back to some sort of former Sabbath. The law of Moses, which includes the Sabbath, 
You will not find a distinction in the law itself or in the New Testament. Was given to Israel and only Israel. Now, a little point, but some will try and separate the Ten Commandments from the rest of the law. You can't do that. Because most of the rest of the law is an exposition, an explanation, and application of the Ten Commandments. All the laws regarding, for example, in Deuteronomy 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, I believe it is, I know 22 for sure, uh, about laws regarding marriage and all those situations, it's an applic- that section is an application of the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. So what does that look like in practice? So most of the law is an expansion and application and teaching on the Ten Commandments. So you can't, you can't divide the two. So I want to consider just three quick passages of why I, we make this point, why I make this point that the Sabbath was given only to Israel, which is in that law. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. If you want to turn there, you can. I'm going to help you this morning. This is one of the few times I'm going to do this. These three scriptures are going to be on the screen. Deuteronomy chapter 5, 2 through 3. Oh. I want to thank the Hewlett's for pointing that out. Otherwise, that would have been the third lesson I've preached here in three years in which this was not on. Don't worry. It'll be up there. In fact, there you go. And just a note. The bulletin contains a lesson outline with all the scriptures used. So be sure to pick one up in the future. That way, if I do this again, you don't miss anything. Anyway, thank you. All right. It's on the screen now. Deuteronomy chapter 5, 2 and 3. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, with all those of us alive here today. So God, in Deuteronomy, is telling the children of Israel, this is what he's saying, he made the covenant with us at Horeb. Horeb's in our word and our name from Mount Sinai in which the law of Moses was given. He says, that's where he made this covenant. So the first five books of Moses, the law of Moses, which includes the Sabbath commandment. He said he did not make this covenant with our fathers. That means Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Adam, Seth, Abel, They didn't have that covenant. We do. Psalm 147, verse 20. He declares his words to Jacob, his statutes and his ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. As for his ordinances, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. Now this is a generic praise, you know, this is a generic praise and that point about God's ordinances but note the order. It doesn't matter what the ordinance is. It doesn't matter what the law was up until this point. God had not dealt thus with any other nation, and he had, other nations had not known his ordinances. Sabbath, the food laws, the covenants, the tabernacle, all that stuff. Egypt, didn't know about it. Babylon, didn't know about it. Greeks, Romans, Gauls, and you know, early France, didn't know about it. It was given to Israel. And God had not dealt thusly with any other nation. Third verse I said. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. This one hits the nail on the head. as Well, I believe the other two did as well. Now Ezekiel, like the other major prophets, they are pre- he is preaching to Israel, preaching an oracle of repentance and judgment. And if they would repent, the thing would relent. But in this, in these prophecies, you often have God starting out with declaring his faithfulness. What has he done for Israel? All his goodness, how he has been patient and long-suffering with them. And then it gets to the, the point about the grievances. So he says here, talking about the goodness he's done, he said, also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Now, he didn't give them only the Sabbaths, but this is what he's saying here. He gave them the law, the testament, the Sabbaths, as a sign between him and Israel that he is the Lord, their God, who sanctifies them. Hopefully, we have seen that the Sabbath, included in the law, was given to Israel and only to Israel. Second thing we understand about the Sabbath and what we're supposed to do about it, 
and that it contained in that first covenant was temporary. By design, this covenant was not meant to be eternal. Now, we're going to make this initial point here, and this will flow into our next point, which will expand upon this, so stick with me. In Jeremiah chapter 31, that should say 31 and 32, we're going to read, again, another major prophet, another prophecy against Israel. This is before the captivity of Judah. So in Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 31, it says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. In the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. So his major point here is this covenant in which this new one I'm going to make with them is not going to be like the one I made with them in the day of the Exodus at Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb. It's going to be different. Okay? If something new is coming, what does that mean with the old one? It's done away with. You know, if I were to make a last will and testament, as I, as I am right now, single, no kids, it would be a very short document. I could probably do it on a sticky note. And say, you know, all, all my stuff, all my debt can go to, go to Paco or something. He can deal with my debt. Um, but if I get married and kids come along later, I make a new last will and testament that provides for all the, the safety measures, all the financial benefits, all that kind of stuff to make sure they're taken care of after uh, I'm gone. And if I were to die, do you read the new last will and testament or do you read the old one? Which one is legally binding? It's the new one. It's the updated one. It's the one that's in force. It was made by the person who made the original. The old is replaced. So he's going to make a new covenant with them. It's not going to be like that. If you want to read further, 33 through end of the chapter, really, God describes what that new covenant's going to be. It's not going to be, I'm, and it's not going to be that every man says to his neighbor, know the Lord, for they will all know me. They're not, going to have, they're not going to have an external law anymore. The law will be written in their hearts. It sounds a lot like the covenant, the testament that Jesus brought. Speaking of Jesus, if you turn to your New Testaments in Matthew chapter 5, in the New Testament we read the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, starting verse 17 through 18. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of the law shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now a little note here. Again, Sabbatarians will say, well, fulfilled does not mean to be done away with. It means it he's means going to continue to be in force. That's not what fulfill means. Fulfill means to bring to completion. To bring to an end. When I worked in a bo the bookstore in college, we would get orders. And I would fulfill the order. It was filled, sent out. That didn't mean I still had that order I had to keep on fulfilling. It was done. I'm pretty sure everybody's glad that it was done because I don't know about you, I don't want to keep buying $800 textbooks forever. It's filled, it's done. So what is Jesus saying here? He's saying, I have come as the culmination, the fulfillment, the pinnacle of what the old law was pointing to. He is saying here, and as he says later in the verse, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Okay, when you accomplish something, you, you've achieved something. Something is finished. In 2017, when I graduated from college, I accomplished the requirements of my degree. I'm still not in college. I finished that. It's done. It's away with, which I'm very glad. And a little note here. Really what he's saying is when I came not to abolish... As one writer, one scholar put it, he said he did not come as some kind of, quote, religious rebel bent on discrediting, invalidating, and promoting contempt for the Mosaical law. On the contrary, 
It was the only one in Israel at that point who was actually teaching it accurately and following it and living by it and kept it perfectly. When you see him clashing with the religious leaders, it's because they were holding more tightly to their traditions and their man-made interpretations instead of what the law actually said. So when they said he blasphemed or perverted the law or twisted the law, no, he didn't. He was messing up their traditions. Jesus' life and ministry were the fulfillment of the whole of the old law. You want to look in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. We're going to be in Hebrews a fair amount in the rest of the lesson. You want to put a bookmark anywhere in Hebrews for quick access. But in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, referring to Jesus, the writer says, Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now the Hebrew writer is writing to a group of Christians who are facing persecution who wanted to go back to the old covenant. And right now I'm going to tell you what the whole book of Hebrews is about. In one word, better. The Hebrew writer's argument is that why would you go back when we have the better covenant, which was enacted on better promises, with a better sacrifice, with the better blood of Christ. You know, it appears, that word better appears 13 times in the book. There's 13 chapters. It's about once per chapter. It doesn't appear every chapter, but it's there. It's contrasting the old and the new. And the Hebrew writer is putting forth Jesus as this perfect fulfillment, the better high priest, the better sacrifice, better everything. So why would you go back? And that's his main point here. When he offered himself on the cross, that which is old was done away. And this is Paul's argument in Galatians chapter 3. I want to turn over to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to look and start reading verse 16. Now, to set the context for Galatians. The Galatian Christians had fallen for a false gospel. Paul says that in the first chapter. He even repeats the warning twice towards the end of the first chapter. If anyone preaches another gospel, contrary to that which has already been delivered, he is to be accursed, anathema. That is, condemned to the eternal hellfire. Uh, he says that re- twice in a row. They had fallen for another gospel. What was the other gospel? Some were teaching, the Judaizers, that, yes, you have to hear, believe, be baptized, all that stuff, and if you're man, circumcise. If everybody else, keep the food laws, keep the Sabbaths, keep the festivals. You have to do everything the law required. And Paul's major argument in Galatians is that was done away with. We're under we're no obligation. We're not justified by works of the law. That's what his point in chapter 3 is. And that's what he said in the first part of chapter 3. So what we're going to read in 16 through uh, 29, the question comes up is, okay, Paul, if it's done away with, then why do we have it? You can almost see the Judaizer teachers like, all right, Paul, why do we have the law then if it's done away with? Checkmate. And Paul, his answer. Let's start in verse 15. One more verse isn't going to kill us this morning. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a a man's covenant. Yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises which were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, he does not say and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously, previously ratified by God as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted to Abraham by means of a promise. Let's back up. This makes for bad Bible reading. I understand that. But we're going to make a little point here. What Paul is saying is not that the Old Testament law is still in force. What he's saying is the promise to Abraham that in you all nations shall be blessed is not invalidated, that promise, by the coming of a later covenant. Because the old covenant, as Paul's going to about ready to say, was part of that promise, part of the fulfillment of that promise, which led us to the new covenant. Because the argument is, well, we have to keep these works. 
That's how we're saved. And Paul goes, no. Verse 18, for if inheritance is based on law, it's no longer based on a promise. So he's saying if, if, if our salvation was dependent upon us keeping law perfectly, then it's not a promise of God. But Abraham was given a promise, it says in verse 18. So verse 19, why the law then? Paul says it was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not only for one, party only, excuse me, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so, the promise, so, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which is to later be revealed. Because of this, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, because all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor free male, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ then your Abraham's descendants heirs according to the promise. I'm going to try and give you the spark notes of that. The argument of the Judaizing teachers is, well, the Gentiles have to keep this stuff because they're not Jewish. Paul's all, overall argument at the end of this says, if you're in Jesus, you're part of the lineage. And if you're part of the lineage, you're Abraham's descendants, you're an inheritor of the promise. But the promise is not inherited based on you keeping the old law. It's based on... The, excuse me, it's on the basis of faith, which is said in 23 to 28. So again, the promise is not dependent upon law, verses 16 through 18. The law was given because of the transgressions and sinfulness of man. And it was given until Jesus would come to bring about a perfect salvation. That's verse 19. And now that Jesus has come, the law's purpose has been fulfilled to lead us to Christ. And now serves as a tutor to all who would read it today to point us to Jesus. We saw that this morning at the Lord's table when Steve, Brother Steve read, read through Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 today is so poignantly clear in our minds that it would be very hard not to see Jesus in that chapter, even if you had no, almost no knowledge of the Bible. It's pointing to something greater. Jeremiah 31, 31, 32 is pointing to something greater. Moses point is something greater in Exodus chapter 18, I believe, where he says, there will come at a time a prophet like me to raise up among your people. Listen to him. So, this is not the only verse, though. This is not the only place where Paul had to make this argument. Paul and the apostles, this was the big issue in the first century, was the Judaizing teachers trying to bind parts of the old law on Christians. So it's not just Galatians that Paul deals with this. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, just a couple pages over in your New Testament. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Now, he has said in verses 9 through 13 that Jesus saved us from us being dead in our sins. He said in verse 12, we were buried with him in baptism, which we were raised up through the working of faith, uh, by the power of God. And that happened when we were crucified with him and raised up with him. And he says in verse 13, at the end of it, He has made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of all of our transgressions. And we're going to start in verse 14 now. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which were hostile to us, he has taken, away, taken out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So what's Paul saying here? When Jesus died on the cross, as we've been talking about, the certificate of debt, which consisted of decrees against us, was nailed to that cross and done away with. Well, what is that certificate of decrees against us? If you look at verses 16 and 17, he says, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge. Judge to what? In regard to food or drink or respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are 
mere shadow of that which is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. The Judaizers were trying to bind these things. You need to keep the food laws. You need to keep the Sabbaths. You need to follow these festivals and these feast days and all this stuff. And Paul says, because it was nailed to the cross, no one is to judge your standing before God on the basis of those things. Sabbath days, new moon festivals, food laws, done away with. Now, if conscience dictates that you feel you need to like, observe a day of rest or something, that's where Romans 14 kicks in. If you personally feel convicted to do that, then yes, do that. Where Paul draws a line, where the Bible draws a line, which Paul is dealing with in Colossians, Galatians, and Ephesians, the moment you start binding that upon other people, you've crossed the line. The moment you start trying to bind old things of the Old Testament as a standing of you're either condemned or you know you stand there justified or damned before God, that's where you cross the line, and that's where the scriptures kick in and says, No, you need to stop doing that. You're becoming a false teacher, you're teaching wrongly. Do away with that. And it's not the only place, but for sake of time, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15 also makes the same point. He says, By abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments consist, contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. What are the two? Jew and Gentile. What was the thing that divided them? It was the law of Moses. It precluded a Gentile, barring proselytization, from even coming in contact with the people of God, from even having a relationship with God. So Jesus' death on the cross destroyed that and brought those two groups of people into one new man in Jesus the Christ. I hope we have seen that the law was given to Israel and only Israel. The law was temporary. The law uh, was done away with. That includes the Sabbath. And in the short few minutes we have left, I'll leave you with this, and this might be a little bit rapid fire. Um, we also have the witness of the New Testament church, how the Sabbath was not practiced as an ordinance or dictate of the church or the New Testament. So the church was established on the day of Pentecost. That's Acts chapter 2, and verse 1. According to the law, Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 and 16, Pentecost fell the day after the Sabbath. That's a Sunday. So the church was established and began to meet on the first day of the week for worship, and that became the practice throughout your New Testament. In fact, if you look at just some of our verses, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, Luke reports there, upon the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. That's uh, it's another word for Lord's Supper in the New Testament. The verse continues on to say that Paul began his message and prolonged it until midnight. I'm not going to prolong mine until midnight, but I could. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, regarding the collection for the relief to the saints in Judea because of the famine, Paul said, upon the first day of every week, each one is to lay by in store as he has prospered. Well, why are they assembling on the first day of the week to begin with? There's many other scriptures, uh, but I think these two are sufficient. And we need to know that while it is true, you can find some Christians in your New Testament practicing the Sabbath and other parts of the old law. It's important to recognize that inspired apostolic teaching sought to correct that practice. For example, in Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, Paul says, Verse 10 and 11, excuse me. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. Okay, Galatians, the same letter we just read a little while ago, where some were trying to bind the Sabbath and the food laws and all that. Paul says, you're observing these things. I am fearing that I have preached to you for nothing. Because you're not getting it. And if you look at the early church writings of the Patristic Fathers, uh, from the 1st century through the 4th and 5th centuries, you find that no Christian practiced the Sabbath. The Epistle of Barnabas, which dates to A.D. 120, in discussing the things about incense, new moons, and Sabbaths, he said, the Lord abolished these things. And, in and he was writing in defense of the new law which the Lord Jesus brought into effect. Um, 
He says later, he says, Wherefore also we keep the eight days with joyfulness, the day also which Jesus rose again from the dead. Tyrillian in A.D. 200 argued that the old law had been consummated. Excuse me. Con- it was destroyed. There we go. Thus, the observance of the Sabbath is de- uh, demonstrated to have been temporary. Eusebius in 324, the Father of Church History, stated that uh, the Sabbath observances do not belong to Christians. On the other hand, he asserted that the Christians celebrate the Lord's Day in commemoration of his resurrection. Jesus came, died on the cross for our sins. In doing that, he removed that covenant which no man could keep, which no man could be fully justified and have lasting salvation through. That's new. Jesus came in order to bring about the law of life. As we end, I want us to look in Hebrews chapter 10, and this, the lesson will be yours, and we'll offer the invitation. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1. For the law, since it's only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. Jump down to verse 10. That's why Jesus came. It's going to be verse 4. I'm going to give you a whiplash. He said, For it's impossible for blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Verse 10. By this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. What the blood of bulls and goats could not do, the blood of Jesus could do. What the law was unable to do, the law of Christ does do. And so that's why he says in verse 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the household of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Because Jesus died, we don't have to live fearful of, did I keep the law right today? We have the confidence by his blood to not just walk before God. We can boldly enter the throne room with full assurance, no timidity, full assurance. Because why? We have been washed. We have been cleansed. We have been regenerated by the blood of Jesus. And if you want to look at 1 Peter 3.21 and reference that, that verse we just read, have our hearts sprinkled clean from, a, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Peter makes the same point in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Correspond to that, that is the flood of Noah, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're united with him in resurrection. That's when the Spirit descends upon us and restores our sin-sick soul. That's Titus 3, verse 5. He died that we would not have to live in slavery to sin and fear anymore. If you're here this morning and would like to be uh, united with Christ through the waters of baptism, to be resurrected to new life, we can assist you with that. There is water ready. If you've done that in the past and you're not living faithfully, you're not living uh, according to the New Testament, and you realize you've erred, uh, this is the time you can get right with God. If you need sin that needs confessing or prayers of strength and encouragement, whatever your need, please come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation.